This is my cat Spot. I think it might be a shapeshifter. I fear for my safety. This is the best of Trek, worst of Trek. I'm your host, Dustin Wing. Starting in at number 582, Blind Luck, or Is There in Truth No Beauty? In another reference to Greek nonsense, we meet the race Medusans, who are said to be formless, utterly hideous, and no human may look upon them without going insane. Diana Maldar returns as a human able to be around a Medusan ambassador when it's beamed on board to be transported back to its home planet. A lover of Miranda, Kolos, also comes on board to badly recite cliché soap opera lines. He is so jealous that she will be leaving him when she goes to the Medusan planet. He tries to kill the ambassador, but looks at it and ends up going insane. We find out after that Miranda is blind and therefore immune to the creature's insanity, and her dress has special sensors that allow her to sense her surroundings similar to Geordi's visor. By the end, Spock mind melds with the Medusan, because he'll mind meld with a toaster if you let him. Honestly, this one starts out interesting and devolves into cringeworthy nonsense with each passing minute. I've got a lot of questions, but the only one I'll pose is why does Kirk mansplain blindness to Spock in front of a blind woman that Spock directly asked his question to? Buying some melons at 581, dream police, or random thoughts. While on a planet trading for supplies, a series of violent actions and murders occur. Neelix is feeling a little rusty since Kess, and uses the euphemism wanting to buy some melons, till an old woman stabs the age-appropriate melons he's interested in. And the authorities blame this, and an earlier incident, on a single violent thought Balana had in passing. It turns out bad thoughts are outlawed. Tuvok works to clear Balana of the crime, only to find out there's an underground ring of people that pass violent thoughts for profit. He uses himself as bait and offers to share some really deep, nasty thoughts that his Vulcan psyche has repressed. He honestly seems to be kind of getting into it, or getting off on it or something but turns over the group to the authorities and gets Balana back. This one is really weird. I don't consider it a good or bad episode, really. But we get to see not Bator, the Doros sister, without a bunch of Klingon makeup. Being overtired at 580. Wesley and the Nanites. Or evolution. Wesley's science project of reprogrammed medical Nanites gets loose when he accidentally falls asleep They get into the ship's computer core and start eating it. The Enterprise has a scientist on board, prepping for his magnum opus experiment. When it looks like Wesley's mistake might put his life's work in jeopardy, he irradiates a section of the computer core to wipe out the nanites. It turns out these microbots have become sentient and respond in several ways, including trying to kill the scientist. Picard figures out a way to make contact with them and agrees to help settle them somewhere if they stop their negative effects on the ship. After an apology by the scientist, they even assist in getting his mission back on track so his life's work isn't in vain. Boldly going where they shouldn't at 579, Doctor Needs a Doctor, or The Swarm. Tom and Balana in a shuttle are attacked by random aliens, and only now does Neelix advise Janeway that the space they're entering is populated by people that don't let anyone leave alive. It would take 15 months to go around, but Janeway is like, to hell with the regulations, and goes ahead anyway. When the doctor is about to perform brain surgery, he realizes he doesn't know how to perform brain surgery. Apparently, his unplanned extended runtime and tinkering with his program has caused some serious problems. They run a program made to diagnose problems with the EMH, only to later figure out that they can use the diagnostic program as an overlay to fix the doctor's damaged matrix. But now they don't have a diagnostic program anymore. It takes the doctor some time, but eventually he gets back to his old self. 
Meanwhile, Voyager has a serious problem when they detect thousands of tiny ships headed toward them. They start latching onto the hull before the crew come up with a defense and get away just in the nick of time. Kess is actually decent in this one, and she should be more demanding and assertive more often. If you do not like and subscribe, this shapeshifter will likely absorb me and take over my life. Being annoyed at 578. Overbearing ambassadors. Or liaisons. A cultural exchange takes place when two ambassadors come to the Enterprise to learn about Federation culture, and Picard is to return with a third on their shuttle to visit their home planet. The shuttle takes a turn for the worse and crashes on a random planet, seemingly killing the pilot. Picard finds another crashed ship with a woman that's supposedly been alone for years. She pushes his buttons and tries to keep him there even though he does everything to try and get off the hellscape of a planet. By the end, it's revealed it's really the male pilot taking the form of this woman to learn about love through stressful situations or something. Back on the Enterprise, Worf is assigned an ambassador that's purposely trying to make him upset until he's had enough and hits him at the poker table. Deanna has to deal with one that wants constant pleasure and finally meets her limits of chocolate. This episode tries to have a message about acceptance and differences of culture, but it gets severely bogged down by Season 7 hokiness. Birthing Bugs at 577, Mama Archer, or Hatchery. Enterprise comes upon a crashed Zindi insectoid ship. They find the crew dead, but a hatchery of unborn baby insectoids. Archer has some goo sprayed on him while in the hatchery and doesn't realize for the rest of the episode it's affecting his judgment. He orders the babies to be protected at all costs, including transferring a sizable chunk of Enterprise's antimatter to get the ship's reactor going again. When another insectoid ship comes, Reed destroys it, and Archer relieves him of duty because they could have been on their way when the hatchlings were rescued. Archer ends up having to relieve T'Pol also when she won't transfer the antimatter and leaves Major Hayes in command while he plays Mama, even though it's way out of the Major's scope of training. Eventually, Reed, T'Pol, and Trip go full mutiny and get into a Tarantino-style fight and standoff on the bridge. It's kind of reminiscent of the end of the TNG episode Conspiracy. Once they take control of the bridge, they then go and stun the captain, retrieve their antimatter, and get the captain treated. Even though Archer was under the influence of the insectoid goo, he makes a few good points I think he would have made anyway. He can't make the crew understand that he's trying to prove to the Zindi that humans aren't the threat they perceive, and saving a ship full of younglings could have gone a long way. He tells the story of an ancestor during the eugenics wars who was a commander who got in contact with the commander of the opposing side and agreed to a temporary ceasefire long enough to evacuate a school full of children. And even in war, there are rules and responsibilities. Archer turning into a mama insectoid gets pretty ridiculous at times, but the episode has a lot of good dialogue and points also. New Trek finally makes the list at 576. Icheb Bejazzled, or Stardust City Rag. This episode is bookended by the deaths of minor characters we've met before in Trek, with many other random deaths in between. First off, Voyager's Icheb is having his Borg implants removed to be sold for profit with no anesthesia, when Seven finds him too late and can only put him out of his misery. His death is only to lend emotional weight to Seven's character going full vigilante. Later, the La Serena crew dress up as cartoon villain stereotypes in order to broker a deal in the Star Wars Tatooine Cantina for Measure of a Man's Bruce Maddox. Picard does an overacted French stereotype and comes off as Pepe Le Pew. As if things couldn't get any worse, we're treated to the dumbest villain name in all of Trek and maybe in all of television history. Bejazzle, who's the childlike empress from the never-ending story all growed up, obsessed with collecting Borg implants, and it turns out she's the one who had Icheb killed previously. The crew uses Seven as bait to try and trade for Maddox before they realize she's double-crossed them 
and she's really on a personal mission to kill Bejazzle. They escape her, but Seven goes back and wipes her out and her guards. Meanwhile, after it looks like they got Maddox back just in time to save his life, his old flame, Dr. Girardi, kills him because of what she's been shown by Commodore O. We killed Maddox just to bookend this stupid episode. Might as well bring Data back so we can kill him again, too. Uh, oh. This one takes so many cliché twists and turns that really take you squarely out of the main season-long arc, even though it moves it along just enough. This might be the highest body count in Trek, not during wartime. With all the crazy stuff in Seven's backstory, did they really need to kill Echab just to give more emotional weight to her character? Bejazzle wears a dress made for a 19-year-old raver, but it's being worn by a 45-year-old woman. The personalized hollow ads from Reading Your Mind are a really stupid touch. Where are they being hollow projected from? As a nice background touch, we see that Quark has franchised his bar and has an establishment on FreeCloud right next to Mr. Mott, the barber's shop. Overall, though, this one feels like it was written and directed by Michael Bay. Who directed this piece of Bolian feces? Jonathan Frakes? Ah, computer. That program is available. Thanks, Major. The program is activated. Thanks, Major. Jupiter Station program is activated. Thanks, Major. Matrix Overlay program is active. Please stand by. Thanks, Major. Zimmerman program Alpha 1 is now complete. Thanks, Major. Major. No control malfunction has been recorded. Thanks, Major. On to Bishop 4. Knight to King's Rook 3. Thanks, Major. Major. The food slot is functioning properly. 